Today we're going to talk about the differences between recessives and incomplete dominants. Now you might notice I did not say co-dominance, I said incomplete dominance. A lot of people freely use the word co-dominance to this day. They're incorrectly using the term and I'm guilty of that plenty of times myself. But we're not going to really be talking about that too much, nor are we going to get into the sciency parts of this all that much. For a scientific view of all of this, I'll turn your attention to Prince Reptiles. He did a whole thing on the genetics around ball pythons. But I want to talk about recessives and incomplete dominance specifically together because there's a good amount of people out there that would argue what's the difference, at least in a specific set of morphs in some cases. Some people I've encountered think there's really no difference at all. And some people think that a lot of the recessive morphs that we call recessive aren't, that they're actually incomplete dominant. So let's explore how these genetics work on a basic level that we can all hopefully understand. Very quickly, just to get it out of the way, let's discuss dominant genes. Dominant genes, when you think of them, you might immediately think of genes like leopard and acid and pinstripe. But did you know that the normal wild type ball python is dominant? When you breed ball pythons, they're each going to pass their genetics on, otherwise known as a genotype. This will formulate based on several different matters, which would basically be determined by what types of genetics each one is. A dominant gene is described as something that well, it dominates. If it is present, it is going to make its presence known. This doesn't mean that other things can't also show themselves, unless of course you're talking about the normal wild type. Once you've shown leopard, that gene is dominant in whatever form it is. And having two copies of the leopard gene, if theoretically that is even possible, which I won't lie, I do not really know about that particular part of the science of this all, it's not gonna make a difference. It's gonna look the exact same in either a het form, which is a nickname for heterozygous, which basically means one copy of a gene, or in a homozygous form, which is two copies of the gene. How an incomplete dominant works is that when you have two copies of this gene, you are going to be able to show something completely different. So a pastel shows itself when it's in a snake. A black pastel, many other ones out there, that you can see the example of it when there's one copy. When there's two copies though, you get something completely different. You get what we like to call a super form. So a super pastel is very much different from a pastel and a super black pastel is very, very much different from a black pastel, and in so on and so forth. There's many different examples where the term codominant is misused, is basically a codominant would coexist with another dominant form or another trait whatsoever. So it would show itself not in a blended different morph, it would show itself in different parts on the snake, quite literally. If I had a genetic that made me green, but it only did it in certain spots, otherwise I normally would just look how I am. They would just show in maybe one part of me, maybe my arms, and then the rest of me would be normal. That is a codominant. It coexists with other ones. The only real example that I don't even know if it really is would be possibly scaleless or microscaleless because it exists as a scaleless in just its head. They call it the scaleless head for a reason. Obviously that one has a super form too because once you get two copies of that, you get an all scaleless. But technically it does fit that definition. And in fact, as far as I know, that's the only one that does that unless it is a paradox, which those don't count. They don't follow the normal rules. Now where recessive comes into this all is a recessive gene. It's in the name. It recedes to the other genetics. It will not show itself over a dominant form. If you have a pied and a normal, and you breed them together, you are going to get a snake that looks like a normal. Those normal type genes are going to dominate everything that you see. If it's a leopard, it's technically only got one copy of that leopard gene and one copy of a normal type gene. Now, if there's multiple genes in there, you could say, okay, one copy of the normal type gene, one copy of leopard, one copy of spot nose, so on and so forth. But if you have pied, that is a different story. Super forms and recessives always pass on one copy of their gene. So a pied ball python would pass one copy of pied on. A super pastel will always pass on one copy of pastel, but it will show itself with pastel. It will not show itself with pied, or will it? 
Well, that's what we want to discuss a little bit today as well. But recessives basically need two copies to show. They need two copies to be able to dominate the dominance, if that makes any sense. So if you have a het pied, which has one copy of the gene and looks like a completely normal snake typically, and you have a visual pied snake, that will always pass one copy on. So your snake here will always be a het pied minimum. So what you get in the end is 50% of the snakes will be het pied only and they will look just like the normal type typically and 50% of those snakes will be pied and if you go pied to pied they're always passing one copy you're always gonna get pied so after all that, when we talk about incomplete dominance and compare them to recessives, there should be a clear distinction how different they are. One might hold the gene, but it shows nothing. And one of them holds the gene for the super form, but it does show an example. But what if I told you that that's not always the case? Why do pides have markers if they're recessive? Isn't it a change to their pattern? So are they actually a recessive morph? I've been told that my monarchs, the hets, seem to taper off near the tail, their pattern. And I see it. I see it. And a lot of them and really what gave me the idea of this was when my friend asked me what my opinion was on zebra possibly being the mckenzie gene which is an incomplete dominant and if you look at mckenzie it looks like that could possibly be the case it does beg the question right why do these animals have markers why do monsoons supposedly have a bunch of patterns on the back and why do the zebras which we were talking about their het form look pretty cool to be honest they have a busy pattern they have a lot of stuff they almost look like mckenzie's just a bit and super mckenzie's well they almost look like zebras just a bit it's a very good question because it also snowballs into what recessives are out there that might not actually be recessives and does it matter they kind of work the same anyways i have said that recessives are the future because they are rarer and harder to make so therefore their price goes up but there are plenty of super forms out there that have gone for crazy amounts i would argue that the scaleless had it not been for the challenges of caring for a scaleless snake would have exploded by the way scaleless in my opinion are not bad snakes they're just a little different don't think you're buying a ball python and just having the normal ball python care but it is not a recessive morph and it absolutely exploded if a snake is hard to create like a recessive its price is going to be up it's going to hold its value better so are people rebranding genes as recessives for higher value? That's kind of the question that you hear. And I certainly don't think that a vast majority of people would be rebranding genes maliciously. At this point with genetic testing, that's not going to be a viable thing. Someone's going to be able to send in a shed sometime in the very soon future and determine that that's nonsense. It serves no purpose to do this, especially in the case of something, well, like zebra. The person who founded the zebra gene did so back, I think, in 2000 five it's been a long time and a lot of resources weren't available back then obviously another way to determine this would be to breed one snake to the other and in all the time i haven't heard of anybody doing this so i'm skeptical to say the least on both sides whether that's the case but it's not unheard of and it happens quite often and many times it's quite frankly by accident coral go and banana were proven to be the exact same that one looked very similar but there's other ones lesser and butter were proven to be the exact same gene there's plenty of other genes that have proven to eventually be the same thing but if you're not familiar with a gene and it's obscure and you start working it it can be difficult to determine that at times and if it ends up being the case that the zebra gene is the mckenzie gene and they are identical to each other would it really matter because all we've done now is show how undervalued mckenzie would be if it's the same exact gene and it would skyrocket the price in my opinion now does that suddenly make the zebras less value i would argue that it makes the mckenzie's more value i don't know if there would be a meeting in the middle but either way what it would do is call attention to this genetic so that it can be worked more because if you think the zebra is cool well take a look at Mackenzie. it's cool too so if they are the same gene why would finding out that zebra is Mackenzie and Mackenzie is zebra kill the project no in my opinion it would rejuvenate and add more to it and if it does drive the prices down well good it means I can buy one but are all recessives actually just co-dominance well maybe some of them are but I don't think that speaks for the majority of them I'm not sure but maybe genetic testing can already determine 
the difference. Just on a scientific level of where the alleles lie, what a recessive and a codominant would look like. But I don't think we need to overthink this. I don't know if it really matters because you could probably argue that maybe McKenzie is actually recessive. If it doesn't show a great example of itself, if it's on the fence, maybe you just call it a marker. Maybe it's just slightly peeking through. But in the end, if you really think about it, our goal is to create awesome stuff. So why are we getting so hung up on it? Rather than focusing on the awesomeness, that is before us. That's just my two cents. Would I redo my top five up and coming recessives in our last video now with this thought process in there? Well, if it came out that it wasn't recessive, I kind of would have to, wouldn't I? But no, no, I wouldn't. And I don't work zebra. I've expressed interest in working it, but maybe I look at this. So the only thing that would have changed might be my own personal interests, maybe a deeper dive look into this, a little more research on my part. But would I change the video overall? No, I wouldn't. So I figured we'd make this video just to have conversation. Sound off in the comments. Just try to keep it cool. What do you think? Do you think that overall there's a lot of recessives out there that aren't? Do you think there's a lot of incomplete dominance that are recessive? Do you think that it matters? And do you think that Kennedy was so I hope you enjoyed the video. Again, let me know what you think in the comments below. If you wanted to check out the video that we made previous to this about all the top five up and coming recessives, you can actually check that out right here.